This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 164 is brought to us by none other than Bybit Traders. You know I say this every time we have a big drop in the market, but most trend traders were short, so congratulations to you. If you know what you're doing and you keep your losses trimmed and your winners run, this is a great market for you, and Bybit is a great platform for you. On top of everything it already gives you as a platform itself, it has so many promotions going on. I just got six of them via Telegram, and I am not going to go over them all. Just know. If you click my link down below in the show notes, it'll take you to the blog, which tells you everything you need to know. And at the bottom of that blog is the affiliate link you need to click and get yourself set up, get yourself in this ecosystem, and get yourself making money. Now, you can do this on any platform you want, but just know that with Bybit, membership has its rewards. It is the 10 Minute Contrarian Podcast, and quite the week we've had, huh? Well, quite the Monday, really. Uh, For anybody listening to this in the distant future, uh, we had a really, really big drop in the crypto market this past Monday, and it was spurned on by a number of things which we will talk about today. Now, since then, a lot of things have recovered, Uh, not all the way, but some, in some cases, most of the way. But there was a lot of cause for alarm on Monday. Many people were trying to label it Black Monday, which was stupid. Now, there was no correlation to the actual Black Monday, but there were a series of events that caused the market to panic, uh, mainly the stock market, and that always trickles down and magnifies in the crypto market. And I thought this week was a really good chance to kind of capitalize on this a little bit and take inventory of where we are right now in the overall market and talk about all the bad things going on, uh, bad things that happened this week and just bad things overall, and then also some of the good things. You know, and maybe I shouldn't say good and bad. I'll just say bullish and bearish. Because at the end of the day, we are trying to time when this recession actually starts to take place, which is a fool's errand, right? But you can't just be a perma bear because you miss out on so much opportunity. And if things get bad, and they get really bad for a while, which we've said on the show is a possibility, then there's not going to be a whole lot of opportunity to do much of anything. So you have to get it while the getting's good. So we as contrarian investors have to play with that. And we have to decide, okay, when is it time to continue to take risk? And when is it time to just shut it all down? Now you can play it really conservative and just shut it all down right now. But there's a chance you could be missing out on years of prosperity in certain assets. Now, you might listen to other podcasts and other YouTube channels to where they have shut it all down, but I'll bet you those people are older, and I bet you those people have already made all of their money. And unless you have already reached that level of status, then, you know, people like us have to work a bit harder. People like us have to pay closer attention. People like us have to read past the headlines and break down what's actually going on. And so this is what I'm going to attempt to do here in episode 164. So let's go ahead and start with the bearish stuff. What I'm going to do is I found a really good tweet that kind of sums it all up. Uh, Miles Deutscher is somebody I follow on Twitter, and he put a tweet out listing all the bear cases, and I'm just going to go over them one by one and kind of give my thoughts on them. And uh, feel free to give your thoughts on these things as well. This podcast does go out to YouTube, so feel free to go there at any time. Go down to the comments section and sound off. You know, what do you think? This isn't just me talking. You know, we're all trying to come together to figure this whole thing out, and that's not easy. So the more voices and more viewpoints we have, the better. But let's go ahead and pull this tweet up. It says, reasons why crypto is crashing. First one, Trump presidency odds decreasing. Well, yeah, no shit. I said this before. After the Republican convention, that's probably going to be the peak for Republicans for a while. You know, all the emotions of the assassination attempt, too, have kind of subsided. And I said it before, do not sit there and declare victory like half of Twitter is doing right now. Um, But I don't think that was a really big factor into why the market dropped 20% on Wednesday. Let's keep going. Recession fears, okay, well, yeah, that's kind of a lead into everything else here. Stock market correction, yes. Why was that, though? Next one, yen unwind. Now, this was a big one. And a lot of you who are already Forex traders pay attention to this. You saw it and felt it in the market, I'm sure. And I hope some of you guys profited off that as well. But 
Um, that that I think was probably the biggest catalyst for Monday. There, God, you know, this sucks too because I had a whole episode queued up on the spreadsheet uh, talking about the dollar yen and the yen carry trade, and that's not really going to be an episode anymore. <laughs> But I'll give a quick synopsis of it here. Uh, the yen carry trade was, was huge because while interest rates were rising all over the world, uh, they were not in Japan. So that gave a really great arbitrage opportunity for people to borrow in yen pretty much for free and then put it into a currency that pays them. Then the Bank of Japan finally said, okay, enough of this shit, and they finally increased their rates, uh, meaning this arbitrage was still on just to a much lesser degree than it was before, and people started to liquidate their positions. Now, foolishly, a lot of people thought this was going to signify the next big crash, the next big recession. That's really not how this works. It really is, to me, just one kind of, I don't want to say brick in the wall, because that's when you're building something, um, just one more straw on the camel's back. Let's put it that way. Or, you know, maybe one more thing that happens before the big thing happens. You know, you have to have a series of events that all have to line up before we see this big crash, and that's just one of those things. It had to happen first, and it has happened. Now, speaking of those things, one thing he did not mention was something called the SOM rule, which means that a certain rate of change in the increase of unemployment always leads to a recession, and that has just happened as well. You know, this actually happened last week, uh, but we'll talk about that in a moment, but that's another one of those factors, uh, like the dollar-yen carry trade unwinding that we need to talk about. Because on the surface, it is bearish. Let's see, what else does Miles have here on his tweet? Gox distributions, that's old news. That's been happening. It's already priced in. Geopolitical tensions, okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, when is that not happening? And get, I, we called this before, contrarians. It's only going to get worse and more prevalent as time goes on. It's, there's no stopping it. You know, I know some people hate this phrase, but this really is our new normal. Good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. And welcome to the beginning of that era. Okay, so Miles on here also has a Jump Crypto and what was going on there. Okay, so it says Jump Unwinding Positions. I'm going to admit, I don't really follow this or know what it is. Um, but so many of these things were not crypto native, but this is the one thing that was. But as somebody who tries to follow this market as best he can, and even I didn't know about it, even if it's a real thing, I don't see enough people paying that close attention to it and dumping their positions as a result. So bad on me for not really knowing about Jump Crypto and the role they played. It's a pretty big role, come to find out. But I'm not going to sit there and pretend like I've been on top of this when I haven't because I just haven't. And the worst thing you can do in this space is pretend to know something you don't really know anything about. So we'll move on from here. Does he have anything else? Uh, altcoin dispersion. Not sure exactly what he means here, but he says all of these things together are a perfect storm. Now, allow me to go ahead and add a couple things here on top of it all. You know, we have, so, it, so we're looking for those indicators that every time X happens, Y happens. And the SOM rule is one then the yield curve inversion is another. And uh, it's not the inversion, it's the uninversion after the inversion that we need to really worry about. And we are almost there. We're not there yet, but we're almost there. I'm actually recording this on Friday afternoon. You know, by the time you listen to this, we may get there. Um, I'll actually give you the chart that I like the most when it comes to the yield curve inversion. It's also from the St. Louis Fed. And all you really have to do to see if it uninverts is watch for the number to go past zero. You, you're looking for a positive number. Right now it is at negative 0.5. Let me look at it again. I'm sorry, negative 0 0.05. That's how close we are to zero, and that's how close we are to a positive number. Uh, I gave you the best indicator, which was the interest rate chart from the St. Louis Fed. That's something you can just look up. I'm not going to give that one to you because I already have, but I will give this one to you as well down below in the show notes, and you can go ahead and bookmark it and track it. Uh, because as we all know, that is a very real thing. Now, as soon as it uninverts, we don't get a recession right away, but it's one of those things to where a recession doesn't happen until this happens first. And it's the same with the interest rate cuts. You know, and the one thing I just want to add on is all the bad things we've been talking about as far as the health of the economy goes 
are still bad. None of those things changed. And at this point, there's really not much of anything you can do to make them better. You know, at this point, it's just a matter of when. I do not buy the soft landing narrative for one minute. And if there ever is one, expect it to be very temporary. You know, expect Wall Street and the financial media to declare victory and gaslight everybody into thinking things are good when they are clearly not. But instead of sitting here and talking about these things and how bad it is and how close we are, when the yield curve uninverts, that is a sign, you know, an actual hard physical sign that we are one step closer. And again, as we're about to talk about in a moment, these things are not 100% accurate, but just like we do in trading, we look for probabilities and these things really put the probabilities heavily, heavily onto one side. And all of those meters are tilting negative. The last one we're really waiting for is for interest rates to drop. Um, and it looks like now every Fed officer is finally on board with doing that. So expect that to happen in September. You know, our days of taking the under, I think, are finally going to come to an end. And if they do that, we will be right on schedule with my macro prediction that they will pull the release valve sometime after the presidential election. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm not going to get deep into because that's going to cannibalize another episode I have later on. But I will just say this. My prediction is if the Democrats win the election, then they will pull the release valve sooner as opposed to later if the Republicans win. So just on my blind, ridiculous prediction, I think we will actually have more time to prepare and possibly make some money if the Republicans get in than if the Democrats get in. It would just make sense to me, and I will explain why once that episode drops. But let's move on to the bull cases here, because like I said, if there's going to be some bullishness in between now and then, we need to take advantage of it, especially if there's not going to be much of this happening in the future. You know, if weak men really do create hard times, that scenario usually lasts for a while. It does not correct itself right away. It takes time, and it's a really painful time. So let's get it while it's good, and I still think it's good, and here are my reasons why. Again, most of the drop in crypto is not crypto native, but we do see this. You know, the market does react, the crypto market, I should say, as a leveraged play on the market itself. But even though we just made this entire list of bad things that are happening or have just happened recently in the market, the market itself didn't really treat it that seriously. As I speak right now, on the week, the S&P 500 is only down like uh, half a percent. You know, since the big drop, Bitcoin's only down about 5%. Now that's still 5%, but compared to the sentiment that we saw on Monday, who would have thought we'd have been here? Now, ETH is still down 16%, and that is still giving us a really great discount on altcoins. And if I haven't said it enough times on this podcast, thank God in heaven for the trailing buy. <laughs> oh my God, did that come in handy. Uh, and by the way, for people who want to know about the trailing buy or my thoughts on Avalanche or something like that, you don't need to ask me about it in the comments section. The best thing to do is just to go to my YouTube channel and go to the search box and type in that thing you're wondering about. Chances are I already have talked about it, and I've gone into it in detail. So go do that. Uh, but there are more pros to talk about. Remember how we talked about the SOM rule earlier on? The SOM rule actually failed. How do I know? Am I, am I just saying this to say this? No. Claudius SOM, the inventor of the SOM rule, said it on the On the Margin podcast this week. It came from her mouth. She said, uh, the SOM rule and the SOM indicator is meant to trigger once we are already in a recession, and by definition, we are not. Therefore, this time it did not work. She said, hey, it's not a good sign, which I would agree with. But as we stated before, not all of these indicators are 100% accurate. So what we attempt to do here is we try to find indicators that historically have been as close to 100% accurate as possible, and then do what we do with trading find other ones that are like that as well and try to line them up. And so far we have done that with the yield curve inversion and at the interest rate chart. I still haven't found anything that's as good as those two. You know, maybe the SOM rule was up there. I was not aware of the SOM rule until this past couple of weeks. Um, but at least on the surface, it looks like it has not correctly predicted a recession this time. 
So we can throw that out. Uh, but the biggest bull case, really, at least in the short to midterm, is the Fed hasn't even done the Fed thing yet. Um, we know how manipulative they are. We know how impactful they are, even though it shouldn't be that way. But, you know, I hate the term this time is different because economics and math are still undefeated. But, man, if you can point to anything as to why it might be uh, not completely the same as recessions past, is we have this entity now that can play God and create money and create results in the United States economy, which ripples throughout the world. Now, again, actions have consequences. You know, four or five years ago, they're like, oh, if things go bad, we'll just print the money like it's no problem, like there are no consequences to those actions. And in 2022, we saw the consequences of those actions. It's called inflation, and it's a really big deal. But even though printing money leads to inflation, that is not going to stop the Fed. Because as I said in the macro prediction episode, I think the Fed is not supposed to be a political animal, but I think they absolutely are. I think they want to do everything they can to keep the Democrats in power. Because the Republicans have even come out and said that we are cleaning house if we get in. We know we said this before with draining the swamp, but we didn't have congressional support that time. This next time, we plan on having that. And so if we get in, all you people are gone. So during this election season, what do you think the Fed and Janet Yellen and company are going to try to do? Create an outcome that gets them to lose all of their money and power? Color me skeptical. They are going to drop rates. And it is assumed that dropping rates leads to money printing, and money printing is going to be really great for gold and Bitcoin. If it's good for Bitcoin, it's probably going to be good for the rest of the crypto market too. And if we already know these things are going to happen, or we know the probability is super, super high, why are we going to willfully not participate in that? You know what I mean? So that's why. Even though this is a financial prepping podcast, and we are prepping for the worst. And I would imagine the majority of us are already positioned for the worst. We don't have to really worry about that. We're kind of already there. I mean, sure, I want more cash. Who doesn't want more? But we have the structure in place. We are positioned, and we know what to do. But I would argue that part of preparing for the worst is to make sure you have as much ammunition as possible. And you can't do that by passing on asymmetric opportunities. And this is why I continue to buy in the crypto space. Because, yeah, a lot of it is probably going to dump during the recession. So if I'm going to buy these things and hold these things, I want them at the cheapest prices I can get them. And, yes, I'm going to hold the majority of them throughout the recession. Why? Because I could be wrong about the outcome. And with this level of asymmetry, I don't want to be wrong about that. I would much rather risk just taking it in the shorts for a while, DCAing down if given the opportunity, and making sure that no matter what happens, that I am an active participant in the future of computing, payments, and potentially money overall. Damn the torpedoes. And I can't do that by sitting on my hands even if things get scary sometimes. So I thought this was a good chance to talk these things through because we are going to see other days to where things happen, bad things happen, and we have to ask ourselves, is this the real catalyst for the big move downward? This past Monday was the closest we had gotten to that in a very, very long time. But because of who we are and the way we approach things, it's funny how we don't worry about things like this the way other people do, isn't it? Like, we're good. We're ready. We're positioned. You know, everything else we do from this point on is just icing on the cake, as far as I'm concerned. Because in the end, we're not crazy. We're just early. <laughs>